My name is Jan Bocian and I representing RDS Fund, uh, New Promise Land Seed Fund. Uh, there is a program for supporting startups at the early stage uh, with the support of NCBR, National Center for Research and Development in Poland. But the program is supported also by EU funds. Hello, Chris. How are you today? I'm doing great, Jan. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, we for sure will uh, try to discuss what is important for the startups to think about the global market. This is primarily directed at founders, also, of course, uh, venture capital funds from around Europe and the U.S. that like to syndicate with the RDS fund portfolio companies. If you're a family office or angel looking to partner on a fund uh, that's based in Central Europe, focused on health, well-being, energy and industry transformation, and then again, corporate and innovation teams that are looking for interesting companies, particularly in the data space and, and coming out of the talented region of Central Europe. So those are some of the, the folks we're hoping are watching today. We are as a fund looking for the most motivated teams who are planning to do the startups. That means uh, the projects with the strong R&D component, but also with the specific focus on the health and the well-being, as you said, but also energy security is very important uh, topics and hot topics, how to secure the um, not only renewable but safe energy resources not only for today but for future we've also looking for the carbon neutrality and industrial trans transformation and data science is so important also for that we are looking for the projects with the international commercialization potential and what we are doing in our fund that the, generally we trying to combine the very good uh, scientific competence we having both in Poland and specifically in Łódź uh, with the potential networks we have established both Europe uh, and globally. And uh, for us, there is so important that the startups think about the project from the early beginning, going global. We invest in one particular project, 1.1 million polyzloty that 20% of it is a private capital, 80% is the grant. And that's why we are also looking for potential investors in the second fund, which will make the follow-up investment in the already developed projects. And we could set, validate the business concept because the, our most risky investment will cover the most crucial um, time and period for startups incubation and the validation of the business concept and for sure and the important for, for us is that we are based in Uch. in just 100 years that the small town from 600 inhabitants was grow to 600,000 uh, inhabitants uh, and that was one of the most industrial areas uh, in Poland uh, in those times. And also that was being the uh, innovation and the creativity uh, of the people across the Europe. What we could say, uh, which is uh, and Warsaw is a similar case like Oakland and San Francisco, because uh, there is like, um, we could say, twin cities uh, with the specific uh, situation and what is also important that the center of the logistics in Poland as well as the future fast train lines will be in Łódź and that is a very interesting place to be and to participate in the transformation and create the innovative projects uh, in Łódź with the support of the all levels not only authorities but also the local companies which are looking for cooperation. And uh, further on, uh, I would like to uh, give you the floor, Chris, to say more about the project you developed, Global Venture Academy. That's right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks again, uh, Jan. It's great to uh, finally be doing this presentation after <laughs> years of putting the, the fund together, all the effort that folks have put into it. Um, just a little bit of background. So um, the way that the relationship between uh, the RDS fund and the Global Venture Academy has worked is we we sort of uh, um, prior to the application actually of the fund we 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 talked a lot you know several years ago about uh, you know why not have in a really early stage fund 
uh, an international component that could allow the portfolio companies to have more speedy access to markets and feedback and stuff. So we kind of talked about this uh, several years ago, and I'm really happy that the fund came together and is working, has done five investments now, is amazing. And we're now doing our first uh, global sales academy together to really try to deliver that unique quality of international access and networks that we hope is something that the the startups like and uh, and that our syndicate partners like. So the history of, of the Academy, it really started back in 2013 when we did our first gathering in um, Mountain View, California with a bunch of Berkeley people, uh, SoundCloud, Shazam, uh, Adyen were there. So not such a health oriented uh, crowd at that time, but but certainly very B2B-ish and very uh, data oriented companies. So we've continued to do that every year. And, uh, and at this point, we have this modular ability to, uh, to support uh, as a value adds uh, venture fund. So we're happy that we're doing that with RDS fund. I think that that's uh, what was also important, that uh, our first discussion was coming to the event uh, that was Innovation uh, Poland, uh, US Innovation Week in the oh, right. Bay Area. And that was a that's lot right. of uh, interesting discussion, let's say, and inspiring idea was coming. And finally, the, the good things that we are starting operating the things which was um, developed through our cooperation and uh, a long discussion. No, it's true. I mean, that was 2014. If you can imagine, that's when we met and we did our, we were doing one of our academies in the, in, in San Francisco the same week that the Polish, uh, I think, what was it? The, the top 500, there was some initiative that, that was going on between Poland uh, and the U United States at that time. And we just serendipitously all met and a bunch of people came to the academy that day. And, and here we are, gosh, I mean, how many years later? So it's really great. And yeah, this gives just a little bit more background. I won't go into it. People can read it. Um, but just to give them a sense of what will venture.com, we're based in the Netherlands, but we've always tried to kind of work cross ecosystem. That's one of the strong things that we try to do. And, and we're definitely excited about being involved here as well. So from a global point of view, you can see Vooch is there on the far right. And these other red dots are places where we've either been recently. Um, I know that Piotr was in Brussels recently. Um, we're going to be doing a, uh, an event here in the Netherlands. And then over the summer, we've got some things going on in the U.S. as well. So this is just an example. Uh, and we'll be talking a bit more here as we go on tactics, the whens and the the, 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 the what's and so forth momentarily. With this fund, we're doing it very differently. I think the idea being that you can help a founder to talk to people that are relevant to the business, either partners or potential uh, customers. If you can have those relationships and those discussions early, then it can really help clarify for the company their roadmap, what they're going to be developing, how they integrate with other uh, architectures out there. Uh, Index Ventures has an interesting view on, on expansion to, to, to international, uh, and they describe it basically as two dimensions. One, feet on the ground. You know, Do you need to have people on the ground in another country in order to, to, to get customers, to support customers, or can you do it without so-called boots on the ground? And then the other question is how much of the addressable market is in that foreign market or that international market? In this case, we're really talking about Northwestern Europe and the U.S., and, uh, and the higher the 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 market potential or the market size in that region and the lower the boots on the ground requirement the more the, the earlier a company can actually uh focus on that market as a as a priority um in this case we're not really talking about expansion because these are seed stage companies i mean our 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 business is typically focused on early to growth, but I think that the seed stage is something that there's a lot of relevance as well. According to uh, a Y Combinator, Paul Graham, that a, a startup is a company designed to grow fast. And, and typically where we see problems is, is, is after companies have sort of their regional product market fit, if they haven't done the international, then they go through a bit of a, a flat line and they, they see that box on the right side there to engage those markets where the company plans to be in order to adapt the product, adapt the content roadmap and, and uh, the team, actually the growth team, you know, where are people going to reside? Then on the left-hand side, you know, there's a lot of things companies can do to just ensure that they're capturing the requirements around them, uh, understanding that there are competitors. Uh, you know, 20 years ago when I did my, my startup, we, we, uh, we thought it was competitive back then. And, you know, and here we are, 
20 years later, but then on the right hand side where you're really serious and you're saying, okay, we now want to be driving revenue proactively from that geography and, and, and stop depending on sort of random inbounds that, that are going to come in uh, for the good companies, but um, not in a very high quality manner. I always remember regarding that uh, thinking about the market size. I spoke with my colleague Seppo from uh, Finland, and uh, also there is so many successful startups from Finland and Baltic states. But when right. we started discussing about the business, uh, Seppo always said to, to me, we are only 8 million people a market. We, when we, we planning the business, we make, uh, from the early beginning, we need to think ab about the global markets. And I think those uh, also open um, uh, my eyes and uh, thinking about the product development. That for sure, the Poland is a big market. There is uh, around uh, 40 million people market. But finally, when we're talking about fast growing companies, it is important to incorporate from early beginning the potential other markets or even that uh, potential that in some markets the project could be easier to introduce to the market that let's say test and validate the mvps and let's uh, look for the other channels for the market and maybe some other growing markets is easier cheaper and um, less complicated to achieve the first sales and that's uh, are the things i think very supports so successful uh, startups from finland and baltic states Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, you got Estonia with, I think, 1.2 million people and they have six unicorns and, and, and they do it the way that, you know, the quote unquote Israelis do it in terms of getting out, you know, the gates really quickly and, and engaging the market directly, not via an accelerator, not via some channel a partner, but directly into the market to capture those requirements uh, themselves and understand, you know, like I remember in our company when we started, um, there was a certain point we recognized, uh, we, we thought at first we were going to be a bolt on solution to existing marketplaces. Like there was a company called Commerce One, another one called Ariba. We ended up backing off of that and realizing we wanted to connect to the, to the major uh, ERP vendors like Oracle, SAP. And we had to understand their architectures because the object model underneath the product needed to be able to speak to those applications. So this whole idea of, you know, either, uh, you know, getting out into the new markets, both to build those relations, maybe you get a lucky strike and you find an exact fit because that ha for sure it happens. Um, uh, but, 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 but mainly to ensure that your teams have the right information. And I think uh, that's why I'm so excited about how this fund is designed with a super strong science anchor um, with Piotr and the, the, the team leaders there and, and the, um, and this mindset around international. So, um, this, this slide to me is in a nutshell, it's this concept of iteration, iter iterative development. Any founder understands the importance of iterative development and continuing to get smarter and smarter as you begin penetrating your market. Um, and, and most of the stuff that we see at the top of that sort of those loops, those inter, inter, inter integrating loops is this process of, of, of outbound discovery and, 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 you know, not, not trying to be perfect uh before going in and talking to people that you need to so uh absolutely so there's a bunch of things within a, a global venture academy there's this idea of, of go-to-market development and testing now to me that would be something that would that would be more helpful to an early stage or a growth stage that's really going international but certainly uh small companies can be capital efficient on how they do things that from the beginning and uh and product positioning and competitive analysis i mentioned that before uh, you know, you just never know, especially if you're a technical team, how you're going to be perceived by business executives, kind of the ones that hold the budgets. And so if you can uh, manage to understand product positioning for those different personas, you know, both the CTO or that technology person who probably is more of a peer to the development team in the early stage startup, uh, but also those business executives who, you know, your technical peer at your for your future customer those two guys and or gals are going to have to get along and they're going to have to understand each other. And the more that the uh, startup can speak to the business guy and ex educate that person and not depend on the, the technical uh, co co uh, uh, counterpart to do that job of translating what the value and the risk is of this technology, uh, the better off you're going to be in your sales process. It's just going to be 10 times easier to get across the goal line. 
Um, there's other types of things. I think, um, you know, outbound, basically outbound just means using free methods, uh, uh, reaching out to target lists and to particular role types. So say, you know, you're reaching into to the, to the, to the VP of digital at Pfizer or, you know, Kaiser Permanente or whatever the company is. And, and the benefit of outbound is really you're, you're, you're able to codify what works and what doesn't work. Inbound is dangerous because if you start with inbound, you end up, you know, sucking a lot of your team's time handling and qualifying inbounds and figuring out, do we value this company as a customer or not? And, uh, you know, I can remember um, one of my early experiences here in the Netherlands. Uh, I was working with a big software company and and the founder was uh, a guy named Jan Bon, who actually they were competing with Oracle and SAP in the uh, in the, the first generation of enterprise software. So the guys, you know, did very well. Um, and uh, and he described that, you know, probably 20 percent of the customers that they had by the time they exited, I think they were a unicorn back then. Um, that, that, that their customers really 20% of them were the ones that really drove the business value and that drove the exit. So, you know, a lot of times we take on new customers, uh, but they can be, uh, you know, not in the bullseye require custom development. Um, uh, and, and, and this is typically a problem, especially with data science companies, because, you know, data science is such a consultative type of category of technology. Um, it's very tempting for, talented data science teams to sell into an industry that they may not have planned to do because they're in a sales cycle and someone asks them that they can do something and, and they say yes. So um, so outbound leading to a, a solid inbound is a, is a great way to go and we try to cover stuff like that. Um, funnel building and lead gen quality, um, content roadmaps, video sales letters. You know, one of the I think one of the big ahas for me as a guy who's been doing B2B for 20 years or so is I think the uh, the remote aspect you know three years ago before covid i probably with clients i was probably going to the us six to eight times a year and uh from from uh the netherlands here and it was i sort of viewed it as a lever you know you visit someone or a city it's a, easy to get meetings you know people will take meetings when you're flying in from from warsaw they'll be like, oh well, this guy's coming in from europe okay i'll meet with him but um but I think that this video sales letter concept is is sort of the, the 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 fundamental thing that people don't realize yet. How we've seen personalized sales in B two C for ages, um, but the ability to build out very educational, not product feature walkthroughs and this is what it does, but much more video sales letters that take the time to talk to these executives, understand what they're thinking, understand their concerns, and then write a script for that video that, that addresses their concerns from the beginning, rather than leaving them hanging and having to do a, you know, grab the CEO and drag them into a sales call because, you know, the CEO is the best explainer uh, in chief. Uh, no, get that stuff into the videos and uh, and then slice and dice those videos and and use them educationally over several weeks or months. That to me is uh, is the trick. And 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 people ask why does deep technology out of Europe not grow globally? This is the answer to me. <laughs> is these is these very well crafted educational videos that allow international um, buyers to trust you and to understand what it is you're selling. So uh, that's a big part of sort of this academy is learning how to do those sorts of things. If you don't feel like you have the commercial product that sells itself yet internationally, you can you can go through an OEM, you know, you can go through, uh, there was a, a Berlin company uh, doing IoT and we ended up getting really lucky and uh, and 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 Cisco, uh, we went out and talked to 25 companies in the IoT space, Cisco was one of them, and they had just opened up their uh, their Linux guest system like literally that month when we went in to meet with them and it just happened that they wanted this industrial application out of Berlin sort of on their router because the Huawei prices were gobbling up the low end of the market for Cisco and they needed to make more intelligence packed into their devices so they could justify the price. And so, you know, having an OEM partnership uh, was something which enabled that 30 person startup out of Berlin, technology partners as well, you know, for companies that are in the data science space if you can manage to go in and 
and contribute to a listed company or something, and you can do something in their tech stack that makes them money, um, and you do it very well, that's another great, great angle to take because both of these things, the OEM partnerships, the tech partnerships, they can be a great backdoor exit for your company. Yeah, that's what we saw last month with a with a company called Gravity out of Budapest. You know, again, around 30 people. And uh, it was the tech partnership that ended up getting them the exit. There are other aspects here, growth tech stacks. There's a lot of technologies now. Yeah, for, for us, it's uh, so important that we have opportunity that our company portfolio could have the access to such, uh, we could say, accelerating activity, not waste the time for the things that could be straighted on um, having the proper direction and proper experts and also the understanding what is needed in the global market. And that's just, thank you, Chris, that, that we create those opportunity for our uh, company portfolio, but hopefully not only in for the, the our teams, but also for the Polish companies, which are looking uh, for the international markets that we could create a special ecosystem to support them in creating and we could say also to decreasing the cost going to the international markets. Yeah, I, 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 of course, that's music to my ears. I'm a, I'm a big believer, and I, you know, um, I think that the idea, the, the benefit of doing this over time, uh, is, is you begin to see the nuances of how to do it, and, and every time you do it, you know, if you make mistakes, you learn from that, and you try not to make the same mistake twice, and, and of course, when you're working with good companies, you know companies that have a great product, uh, and maybe their international muscles aren't completely formed or they haven't had as much time to focus on that. Um, that's a great exercise. You know, great technologies, great teams, but uh, you know, not so solid international engine. Uh, that's a pleasure uh, opportunity to work in. Um, generally, you know, one of the things we think is is a really important aspect is this network effect concept where you know over time you're building these relationships those relationships have relationships and and if you can build those trusted contacts with you know either the um corporate world i mean there's a ton of executives on the business side who i know in the us that that love to they, they understand the talent coming out of europe in particular the data science talent coming out of Central Europe and Poland, I would say, is the, probably the most well-known, you know, of, of that. So anybody that's working in data in, inside a U.S. corporate entity is going to, their ears are going to perk up knowing two or three of your target segments, industry-wise and persona-wise, who are you trying to reach in the niche that you're focused on? So, you know, a niche being a segment of, of the market that's trying to change something about their business. They want to go from state one to state two and all of them in that segment understand that getting from that state one to state two is critical and they don't know how to do it and your solution is the is the bridge that's going to get them there that concept is something which um uh you know gives you an ability to go out it could even be a couple of different vertical industries because you know financial uh, industry is going through digital transformation in their talent area, just as uh, manufacturing companies are. So HR and talent might be something that they both are trying to fix, get from that first to that second state. Relation creation uh, is the one of the most important things. And to avoid a lot of mistakes, the possibility of uh, using the expertise of global venture universities and sales academies, the things that how to not repeat the, um, let's say, problems, risk uh, that already is done and how to avoid uh, the also misunderstanding of the particular market. Because what I sometimes learn that uh, we also need to think when we're going for the new markets and the global markets, what are the difference in the, we could say, culture, what is the difference in the uh, habits of the people, how to talk, uh, what is important uh, to talk about, and all the, the things which create the trust and create the relation to do the business afterwards. And those, for sure, is very important to not repeat the, the, the problems that already is recognized and well-defined. Yeah, and I can remember as a founder, we had two advisory boards on our in our company in the first couple of years. One was more senior people 
that were getting us into companies or investors, what have you. Um, uh, but the other was a more uh, agile group of, of people that we used. And, and I always thought, because I ran product development, I always thought, I always thought about how, how, how important it was to have those conversations with people that maybe had more experience than we did in a particular industry. And we could just talk with them openly about, hey, this is what we're thinking. This is what we're building. And they, they could correct us. And I, like you said, I, I really, really felt that that was helping me walk. I always felt like we were walking down a dark, you know, the, the, like there was no lights. We were walking down a path and, and we needed we needed flames in, and we need torches to kind of point out, oh, gosh, like there's a big hole in the ground over there. Don't step over there because you're going to spend two weeks trying to get yourself out of that thing and then, you know, go over this direction. And, and so, yeah, I think that that idea and this this resource center you know it's coming together and this is something that um you know we haven't talked a lot about yet Jan. but the idea of of this um go to market and ai resource center and i would even call it a community where where we try to bring the the alumni people that have participated we've had i think 250 b2b companies since that first year for sure we will be also happy to to see the questions from other startups what they faced uh, as a problem to enter the international market. And I think that those opportunity to cooperate on that, that will be the very interesting and challenging time. How to, as you already said, uh, decrease the risk of losing the most uh, crucial resource the startups have. That means time to the market. And that's, that is the clue. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Helping them to, uh, to, to, um, do more without requiring more. Um, so this, this would be an example of, of an asset within that resource center. Um, it's like an 80 minute series of videos. Uh, each is like 10 minutes long and they cover different topics. Like how do you, you know, one of the most important things when you're small is you know, not distracting your whole team with international stuff because it's going to crush the team. So, you know, you got to figure out how you kind of, I mean, my personality is, is, is I, I like to communicate most of the stuff to the whole team, but, but you've got to get good at compartmentalizing things and saying, okay, you know, me as the CEO, and maybe I have my head of commercial, or if you don't have that role yet, your head of product development, because that's certainly an area um, that can benefit from this kind of uh, feedback loop. Um, and so using these small matrix teams, um, no matter what size you are, I mean, this is something that we advise uh, companies that are, you know, 500 people uh, and, and are and are and are tuning their international go-to-market. These matrix teams, the small teams that can do things without messing up other people, and they can codify then and then distribute that across the organization. So it's a similar concept uh, for small companies as well. Um, there's some examples, lots of use cases. Our our particular domain focus is really around uh, deep technologies. So you know, technologies that require lots of R&D or make a big impact on the world somehow. And uh, and then also, uh, I'd say the SaaS AI space, so um, mainly business technologies. Then there's uh, sort of, you know, personal breakthroughs, getting more, looking more at the individual side of things, leadership-wise, um, a three-step approach for what's called telescoping, which is, that's how you, uh, you know, is what it, it is what it sounds like. You know, you're sitting in your local market and you've got your telescope and you're peering out into that distant market, um, but you see it up close and you and you keep focused on it. You keep focused on it and you you don't take your eyes off of it until you kind of begin capturing some of the uh, the the the, the, the uh, conclusions about assumptions you've made about that market. And we all know that uh, you can't outsmart the market. I mean, you 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 need to uh, you need to engage it. You need to listen. Um, and and not go in guns blazing uh, unless you you know have another person whose role it is to listen while you're you're, you're blazing away, um, and then we get into more things like uh, over time you know partnerships become important. Uh, thinking about your your pre exit value packing, how it is you're going to build up the valuation of the business so you actually get a decent exit since you spend so much time on on this experience. Um, and, and even post exit, you know, when you, when you do get acquired, it, it doesn't end, you get acquired, you get brought into a new company and then all of a sudden you've got a slightly new title, you get demoted a bit and, uh, and then you take on a responsibility with usually within that acquirer for a year or two 
And, and so if you don't have your sales and growth mojo by the time you're acquired, um, unless you're planning on being an R and D center, because that can be, you know, a, 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 an outcome, um, but you need to have those, those growth skills anyway, because when you're acquired, you're going to have to deliver on whatever the acquisition was justified for. If they thought they were going to take your 6 million in revenue a year, acquire you, and then they were going to have their global sales distribution and clientele help bring that up to 60 million. Well, you're going to have to be the one leading that charge of that 54 million Delta, which is a pretty big responsibility and uh, kind of stressful as I can attest to. Um, anyway, so, you know, other things, uh, you know, creating, creating the video sales letters, there's lots of, of things that are included in these videos, um, which map a little bit back to the prior slide. Um, but these are the types of things that we, we want to, uh, to make available. And again, this is all just sort of coming part and parcel of the Academy. And, um, and we hope that uh, Jan, as you said, we hope that we can understand what people want to hear about so we can make a video about it. Either we'll do it or we'll grab someone from the RDS network, uh, that knows something better than we do and we'll ask them to help out. So for sure. Yeah. And that will be so important to, as we said, to make the team concentrating on the development and to create the opportunity in, uh, instead of creating the risk uh, related, uh, so, because some of the teams we observed just, um, uh, have the difficulties to put the question generally. And uh, what all was also, uh, as you remember, we discussed also with Whitney, that uh, in Poland, there is an example that people are sitting on the table discussing the final product to be perfectly designed instead of asking the, the, the clients because partly they are afraid what will be the response from the market. But I think all of these things is so important from early beginning to understand the needs of the market and ask proper question. And that is a great opportunity. And I think that there is a, something unique that we could offer for, for our startups. No, absolutely. Really this idea of having a capacity within the fund to, uh, to uh, either open, uh, open doors or take some assumptions and go out and test those assumptions together with the startup. And then of course, as you start getting into the more commercial side of the business, the actual you know, team development and the funnel building and the videos, all those sorts of things begin to come into play and, and are particularly relevant, I think, in this market where we know you know, valuations aren't going to continue going through the roof because of the market we're in and, and the money that's being raised, even those huge rounds. I mean, remember when you raise a 50 million euro round, it's a blessing and a curse because it's, 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 it's an assuming a, a future, you know, valuation and return, uh, in, in the many of the investors have preferences. I mean, I know that we raised 70 million at my company and you know, it took about 12 years for us to get to the revenue mount where I actually was going to make anything from my equity because uh, investors were in line ahead of me to, uh, you know, to, to get their return. So at any rate, uh, this idea of early stage international um, adaptation and then more kind of um, growth stage, uh, those are both of those have relevant international go to market maneuvers, either through coaching uh, through some joint uh, gatherings, uh, but then also a couple of things we have coming up. Maybe Jan, you can describe the first couple bullet points on the activities going yeah. on, and then I'll do the last two points there. Yeah, that's uh, we from the early beginning understand that with uh, our seed capital investment, we need to think uh, with our teams and our company portfolio about the next rounds of investment. So we are preparing the teams also to be ready to as you said, acquire the, 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 the funds because uh, there, there is a responsibility afterwards for the team when they receive the new investment. So we're looking for the uh, potential funds also, not only in Polish uh, R&D uh, activities, but also directly to the Brussels or our other joint international programs that Poland was jointly support financially that the, the potential teams and our company 
uh, from the portfolio could be supported by this type of the money. And I think it's so important that Piotr is involved in the different groups of the activities uh, related to health uh, and uh, health in transition. That there is so important to understand that. And also um, the network like uh, we create, we've exchanged the information like uh, uh, we could directly check if something is uh, on the market uh, available in the particular countries both there is an interesting case between poland and uk there is uh, let's say uh, when the uh, uh, brits uh, come out from the eu that there are that uh, some opportunities appears and also what we already have that is incredible on, uh, uh, human resources in Poland, in the science, and uh, also the very well uh, equipped uh, laboratories, which was supported through the different EU funding. And that could be used for the startups development. There is something new in Poland generally, but this uh, asset we receive from different types of the funding is, uh, I think, one of the interesting opportunities to invest in Poland in R&D to go afterwards for the international markets. That, 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 that is clear. And for sure, the new uh, funds uh, for the present period of EU, which means the next seven years, there is invest in EU, there is a new financial and VC opportunities that we also exploring how to bring the further um, capital for growth and to develop the, the products and establish well on the markets. And uh, I think uh, further on, there is something that you, Chris, is doing. There is uh, this direct connection to the US market, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, so the way that, uh, you know, when you work in an area for a while, you start to try to uh, structure it in a certain repeatable way. And, and one of the one of the tactics that I think is a great tactic, especially right now in the sort of the ongoing COVID time here, is this idea of um, testing some assumptions in the U.S. market directly. And, and, and so we actually, on behalf of a group of companies, we uh, will go to the U.S. occasionally and we'll uh, visit several cities. We'll meet with people directly from the list of companies that the portfolio likes to meet with or our individual clients. And, and so that's something which, uh, which we're going to do again this year. We're doing it. We're going to be, um, actually, I'll be heading on, on a plane uh, in about three weeks here uh, to head to, um, let's see, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Seattle, Los Angeles, um, maybe another place or two. And the idea there is to go sit down across the table from, uh, from executives you know, we did this with Cinerize, uh, that's a Polish company. You know, we, we met directly with the VP of one of the top five retailers there, the head of digital who ran, I don't know, an 800 person a development team and grew them to billions of dollars in revenue. And, and that face-to-face -face time, you know, the hour to hour and a half we had directly there um, led to um, uh, their first POC request, which came in from, uh, from that brand. And, uh, you know, and that took some months to do, but those initial in, in, engagements is what builds the trust. And, and, you know, typically that executive will say, oh, I had no idea. I, I think in the case of that guy, it was, you know, oh, we, we've heard of an Israeli company in this AI space for marketing, but we didn't know there were companies in Europe doing it too. And, and, and so that was an eye-opening thing for them. Um, and so that kind of feedback loop is something which, uh, which is a great way to go. And, um, and so, any companies um, uh, in the RDS fund, or you know, any companies generally that that would like to be a part of that, are welcome to to uh, reach out, and we can tell you more about it. And then, of course, you know, we we also want to spend some time because you know it's such a unique opportunity uh, to to have a fund like this, and uh, in the the history that we're in right now in the world, to to really double down on the relationships between uh, Poland and the U.S. markets and business. And, and really make sure that we, you know, we're not we're not cooperating only in, in the, the defense department. You know, we got to support each other in lots of other fields as well. And so this hopefully can be a little bit of an architecture for that. We're certainly going to try and we would love to meet with people um, both in the Benelux, Northwestern Europe and the U.S. interested in, in, in partnering with us in the future. 
Um, the other thing coming up <clears throat> besides the U.S. market research uh, trip is uh, is an uh, Grow with AI. It's an event. It's going to happen in Benelux September 15th. Um, uh, RDS portfolio is welcome to join uh, for free in that, that session if you like. Uh, and then other companies, if they'd like to participate, just reach out to us and let us know. We're going to have uh, 30 C-levels from 5,000 employee corporate and above. So big, juicy uh, logistics companies like DHL and others um, uh, will be there. And, uh, and then we'll have five to eight startups and that's it. So it'll be, you know, three to one ratio in favor of the startups. And, uh, and they'll present and get to know each other. And, and, uh, and then we'll do an after party uh, with another bunch of people that'll come in. So that'll be in Rotterdam. Uh, it'll be online and distributed. Um, it's a tactic, again, you know, having really small, really senior events that are super curated, that are short, lots of knowledge sharing, uh, but then that, that, that record the videos and distribute them globally to say 500 executives around the world. That's a model which we believe is a best practice and is, is something that every company uh, should be doing to get the word out um, and cut through the noise in the market. So those are a couple of special activities we have coming. Um, the US market trip, again, in three weeks, it'll be a six week project companies can jump into and then the Grow With AI event, people can just participate via RDS fund or, um, or can uh, you know, see if they can, get, they can get involved in some other way. Yeah, just some of my background. I'm not going to go into this much, but just the, the the summary is a lot of time doing product development in the B2B space. We got great customers, Novartis, Pfizer, GE, Google. They, they all became customers. I mean, we didn't realize it was going to happen that way. We just we always felt like we were failing, to be honest, because it just was so, so hard uh, to start the company. But in the end, uh, I guess we managed to do OK. Uh, and then the last 10 years or so has been uh, you know, both on the hardware side. So XTPL out of Ross law, uh, Cinerize, I mentioned gravity out of Hungary recently, um, and some others in the, so what I call the deep tech area. Um, and then more SAS AI, I guess gravity is an example, uh, Cinerize too, maybe, but anyway, uh, using ML for SAS and B2B, these are areas that we considered near and dear to our hearts. And we, we love helping companies in that space um, across multiple verticals. So, um, yeah, great. Again, I think it's a great partnership. Um, you know, I, I consider uh, I consider this funds. You know, us having been there at the beginning, and to now be able to actually realize this idea we had of of combining a super strong science capability with a commercial international capability of putting those two things together is what i'm excited about yeah that's uh i think that that, that is a great uh, opportunity and finally that that uh, we doing into the uh, and putting into the practice the things that uh, we design and discuss quite a lot of uh, time ago but uh, finally we could prove uh, if our concepts uh, work well and uh, hopefully we will deliver uh, the quality and uh, expertise to our company's portfolio as well as other startups because what i think also that uh, one of the important things could be in the growing stage the clustering of the teams that they are doing similar things but they are could find the synergy and uh, the synergy between the different uh, groups different angles for uh, uh, let's say going to the market uh, using the different channels that joint effort many times could be the added value which could bring and accelerate the project to the proper level and um, uh, just I would like to for, for the let's say uh, for the end of our discussion that, that just for the so short summary question uh, from your uh, experience and expertise, Chris, so what is important that the team, uh, the startup should focus thinking about go global and go global with the cooperation with corporates? So, so with, with corporate relationships, um, I, um, so there's, there's a, there's a variety of things that corporates can do. It starts from the feedback and the product uh, shaping and sort of what's the holistic solution, understanding all that stuff. Um, 
Uh, and, and then as you go through the life cycle of the business, you know, you end with an exit. I mean, you could go public. It's, you know, you, maybe you IPO and you are a self-standing company. Um, but, but often there also can be a, a, an, an acquisition. Um, and then in between those two sort of goalposts, I guess there's a whole range of things that can happen. And I, I see the technology partnership as being a more and more critical thing. You know, I saw that with the gravity team last month and how, that provided such a, 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 a great uh, return for them. I think it was a two-year relationship that they had there, um, but they were acquired by an Israeli NASDAQ-based company and or a listed company. And, uh, and it was all because they'd managed to figure out a problem they could solve in the solution architecture of the partner. Um, the OEM is, is, is a little bit similar, I guess, in, in, the, in the case of Cisco, you know, the idea of, of baking your product into a, uh, a, a hardware device, for example. Um, uh, so you're actually integrated with their their hardware uh, solution, uh, and then channel partnerships. Of course, you know channels. Um, uh, I mean, you know, you've got to get them moving. After four to six months, they'll atrophy and and sort of die out if you don't get clients together after a few months. So it can be a big time suck and investment. But uh, channel partnerships, of course, are are another angle uh, with the corporate relations, especially. I guess more consultancies and systems integrators, um, uh, you know, Capgemini, IBM, those types of companies. Um, and uh, what are some other examples of the corporate? You know, you have CVCs, you have uh, investments that the corporates can make. Um, that's sort of a philosophical question for the startup um, of, of whether they want to uh, invest their time uh, that way. Um, the, the positive thing being, you know, you get to know another company intimately. They can, um, they're co-investing, they're, uh, you know, they're supporting you in certain aspects, but then the downside is you can, put, you can get kind of sucked into that vortex and it makes it difficult to work with their competitors and, uh, and really dominate a particular market niche because you've got one particular company that you're, you're really deep with there. Um, uh, but, but on the whole, I think, um, you know, uh, corporate investments can be a real uh, positive thing. And uh, so, yeah, there are these different stages of company and different different maneuvers that are are available to companies. And you know, I think in the end of the day, for a startup, the main thing is to ensure that you have listened to the corporates in your niche across a variety of geographies to the extent that you've incorporated their needs into your architecture uh, uh, and your solution, and and then. You know that you have at least one client, you know, in these different geographies. Because if you don't, it'll be hard to get that um, that little valuation boost and that exit trigger. You know, you're not going to get acquired typically by a company unless you have at least one client in their region. So, so there are a variety of reasons why the corporate thing is sort of a critical path um, from a customer, a customer and product point of view. Uh, but then there are other things that can be done more, I guess, case by case. Uh, but that's kind of how I think of the the corporate question. But is that what you were thinking, or what was your? Yeah, uh, what was that, your that's. Um, I, I think that that um, many times uh, what I learned that people is afraid for the contact with the corporates. But that, that I see in that from the two angles that the, many times the a lot of people going too early. Uh, without uh, ready MVPs and not uh, making research what is really needed. Because uh, you cooperating with the uh, corporates, you need to also make your additional research what is the real need, because that, that's, that, that's not so easy. And that's why also cooperating with the global and, uh, venture uh, universities uh, interesting and important. That, uh, that a lot of questions you already answer, and uh, you know examples, even uh, how to enter the corporates, because that not all angles is many times that the right one, that there is important right. to find the proper way based on the experience and, and expertise. Yeah. And the uh, second thing is the question of readiness. We few times yeah. discussed that uh, 
um, many times the team is not ready even to go generally to the market. The, yeah. Let's say yeah. paperwork, the legal aspects is not clear. Uh, that there yes. are a, a lot of the homework needs to be done uh, yeah. for, for the startups itself uh, to be ready to cooperate in the market and especially cooperate with the, the corporates. Yeah, It's incumbent that the startup segments or kind of puts in clusters different types of contacts that they can make. And so, for example, I would definitely uh, recommend people get out really early and go talk even to those guerrilla companies, but they should talk to a friendly, you know, they should be going in and talking to like a Berkeley alumni, you know, or someone, someone where there's a, a connection, a friendship, you're going to get an hour time slot, not 30 minutes, and it's not going to be a one directional pitch where you run in there and you're stressed out and you're pitching and then you walk out, what just happened? No, it's like you, 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 you do it with a friendly and you do as many friendlies as you can uh, in those first, you know, a few months. Uh, and, and basically the nice thing about that is you don't have to be prepared. You can actually go in and say, I'm not prepared. And, and, but I want to tell you, here's my pitch. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what we don't have. You know, what do you think? And they'll say, Oh, this isn't critical. That's important. You know, and what about this? You're going to go through a sourcing process. You're going to hit our, you're going to hit this this compliance team three months in, and they're going to ask you these 20 questions. You know, you've got to have your your T's and C's already, you know, dotted and crossed for that future discussion. But I think that 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 idea of of not worrying about uh, being prepared in those first few meetings, but doing it with the right people, that's the key thing. And then the the great the awesome thing about doing that is you you just naturally get tuned up. I mean, it doesn't take you know, as long as you're listening and you're kind of adapting, like, you know, Jan, I know that we talked before this call, you know, we were like, what, how are we going to do this call? And we agreed on a few things we would do. And, you know, most of them we actually did. <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, we're, we're finishing up here maybe a little bit longer than we planned to, but, but, you know, the ability to adapt and, 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 and continue, uh, that'll get you super strong when you go out to your, your cold outreach and you want to get to the point where you can go out cold to someone that does not know you from Adam is so busy and you, you hit them with a message and it resonates for them and they just grab it based on the value of what you're describing. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, there's a good way of, of, of jujitsuing that problem. Yeah, that, that, um, as uh, we learn and we know the, the crucial things is uh, uh, understanding how to create the relation and the proper friends and uh, proper angles of entering the fund entering the corporates, entering the market is the crucial things to not losing the time to make the same mistakes like the others was done. Uh, crucial things is how to find the straight way to be the fastest on the market because the competition and growing population over the world, and especially after COVID, as you Chris was said that. Uh, uh, the global uh, village is even smaller. There is a lot of things that could be done uh, digitally that was not even um, possible to think in the past. Uh, let's say three years ago, just only the direct meetings with some people was uh, uh, possible. Today, uh, we could do a lot of things more and save the time for the work and uh, not traveling too much. The crucial thing is find the proper network to develop the project that we hope we uh, our uh, lots um, entrepreneurial spirit and uh, center of europe we could bring uh, both teams and startups from poland to the global market and also welcome the entrepreneurs and uh, funders from uh, the global markets to come to Uch to set up the company operation here and use uh, resources and opportunities which exist in the city. Yeah, I I, uh, I think that the the geographic connection to Vooch uh, reminds me a lot of Oakland. And you know, I lived in Oakland for a long time and I told you it really reminded me of because Oakland was this huge industrial center. It was like the railhead across the country and and uh, all the manufacturing you know in that region were going on there. And then all of a sudden, a lot of it went away. And uh, of course, over time, there's a resurgence. And Oakland, I think, has been a great uh, sort of sibling to, to, to San Francisco as Wooch is to Warsaw uh, with that manufacturing and entertainment industry uh, 
history, which is a really unique thing. So at any rate, well, I really hope that this video was instructive. It demonstrated our commitments, I think, to being a, a fund that's uh, both got that science cap capability, but also the international at the same time. And, um, you know, kind of a openness and, and really wanting to find the best companies and help them out. And, uh, and of course, uh, if we can manage to build partnerships with Benelux uh, funds, uh, ecosystem, uh, Northwestern Europe and, uh, and, and the U.S., then that would be great. So we look forward to hearing from people that uh, are like-minded. And thanks for uh, uh, listening to us today. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and hope to you see you soon. Uh, and also the success for the, your trip in the U.S. And uh, let's say thinking. And uh, for sure, that will be a very important time now for our company portfolio to set up the special workshop uh, we have agreed for them and to uh, learn them how to be prepared for the global markets from early beginning. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon and uh, good progress in the, in the project you have.